Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to listen to the narrative of Mary Jemison as relayed to Dr. Seaver in 1823. I will be reading two to three chapters of this story. And within approximately eight days, we should be finished with the book and you will have learned quite a little bit about Mary Jemison and life in this period of time. So without any further ado, I will, I will begin. A narrative of the life of Mrs. Mary Jemison, who was taken by the Indians in the year 1755, when only about 12 years of age, and has continued to reside amongst them to the present time by James E. Seaver, containing an account of the murder of her father and his family, her sufferings, her marriage to two Indians, her troubles with her children, barbarities of the Indians in the French and Revolutionary Wars, the life of her last husband, and many historical facts never before published, care carefully taken from her very own words, November 29, 1823. Chapter one. Nativity of her parents, their removal to America, her birth, parents settle in Pennsylvania, omen of her captivity. Although I may have frequently heard the history of my ancestry, my recollection is too imperfect to enable me to trace it further back than my father and mother, whom I have often heard mention the families from whence they originated, as having possessed wealth and honorable stations under the government of the country in which they had resided. On the account of the great length of time that has elapsed since I was separated from my parents and friends, and having heard the story of their nativity only in the days of my childhood, I am not able to state positively which of the two countries, Ireland or Scotland, was the land of my parents' birth and education. It, however, is my impression that they were born and brought up in Ireland. My father's name was Thomas Jemison, and my mother's before her marriage with him was Jane Irwin. Their affection for each other was mutual, and of that happy kind which tends directly to sweeten the cup of life, to render connubial sorrows lighter, to assuage every discontentment, and to promote not only their own comfort, but that of all who come within the circle of their acquaintance. Of their happiness, I recollect to have heard them speak, and the remembrance I yet retain of their mildness and perfect agreement in the government of their children, together with their mutual attention to our common education, manners, religion, religious instruction, and wants, renders it a fact in my mind that they were ornaments to the married state and examples of connubial love worthy of imitation. After my remembrance, they were strict observers of religious duties, for it was the daily practice of my father, morning and evening, to attend in his family to the worship of God. Resolved to leave the land of their nativity, they removed from their residence to a port in Ireland, where they lived but for a short time before they set sail for this country in the year 1742 or three on board the ship Mary William bound to Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania. The intestine division, civil wars, and ecclesiastical rigidity and domination that prevailed those days were the causes of their leaving their mother country and a home in the American wilderness under the mild and temperate government of the descendants of William Penn, where without fear they might worship God and perform their usual avocations. In Europe, my parents had two sons and one daughter, whose names were John, Thomas, and Betsy, with whom, after having put their effects on board, they embarked, leaving a large connection of relatives and friends under all those painful sensations which are only felt when kindred souls give the parting hand and a last farewell to those whom they are endeared by, their, by every friendly tie. In the course of their voyage, I was born to be the sport of fortune and almost an outcast to civil society, to stem the current of adversity through a long chain of vicissitudes, unsupported by the advice of tender parents 
or the hand of an affectionate friend, and even without the enjoyment from others of any of those tender sympathies that are adapted to the sweetening of society, except such as naturally flow from uncultivated minds that have been calloused by ferocity. Accepting my birth, nothing remarkable occurred to my parents on their passage, and they were safely landed at Philadelphia. My father, being fond of rural life and having been bred to agricultural pursuits, soon left the city and removed his family to the then frontier settlements of Pennsylvania to a tract of excellent land on Marsh Creek. At that very place, he cleared a large farm, and for seven or eight years, he enjoyed the fruits of his industry. Peace attended their labors, and they had nothing to alarm them, save the midnight howl of the prowling wolf or the terrifying shriek of the ferocious panther as they occasionally visited their improvements to take a lamb or a calf to satisfy their hunger. During this period, my mother had two sons between whose ages there was a difference of about three years. The oldest was named Matthew and the other Robert. Health presided on every countenance, and vigor and strength characterized every exertion. Our mansion was a little paradise. The morning of my childish happy, happy days will, will ever stand fresh in my remembrance, notwithstanding the many severe trials through which I have passed in arriving at my present situation at so advanced an age. Even at this remote period, the recollection of my pleasant home at my father's, of my parents, of my brothers and sister, and of the manner in which I was deprived of them all at once, affects me so powerfully that I am almost overwhelmed with grief that is seemingly insupportable. Frequently, I dream of those happy days, but alas, they're gone. They have left me to be carried through a long life, dependent for the little pleasures of nearly 70 years upon the tender mercies of the Indians. In the spring of 1752 and through the succeeding seasons, the stories of Indian barbarities inflicted upon the whites in those days frequently excited in my parents the most, ser the most serious alarm for our safety. The next year, the storm gathered faster Many murders were committed and many captives were exposed to meet death in its most frightful form by having their bodies struck full of pine splinters, which were immediately set on to fire, while their tormentors exulting in their distress would rejoice at their agony. In 1754, an army for the protection of the settlers and, and to drive back the French and Indians was raised from the militia of the colonial governments and placed secondarily under the command of Colonel George Washington. In that army, I had an uncle whose name was John Jemison, who was killed at the Battle of the Great Meadow or Fort Necessity. His wife had died some time before this and left a young child, which my mother nursed in the most tender manner till its mother's sister took it away a few months after my, my uncle's death. The French and the Indians, after the surrender of Fort Necessity by Colonel Washington, which happened the same season and soon after his victor, victory over them at that place, grew more and more terrible. The death of the whites and the plundering and burning of their property was apparently their only object, but as yet we had not heard the death yell nor seen the smoke of a dwelling that had been, that had been lit up by an Indian's hand. <clears throat> The return of a New Year's Day found us unmolested, and though we knew that the enemy was at no great distance from us, my father concluded that he would continue to occupy his land another season, expecting, probably from the great exertions which the government was then making, that as soon as the troops could commence their operations in the spring, the enemy would be conquered and compelled to agree to a treaty of peace. In the preceding autumn, my father either moved to another part of his farm or to another neighborhood a short distance from our former abode. I well recollect moving and that the barn was on the place we moved to was built of logs, though the house was a very good one. The winter of 1754 to five was as mild as a common fall season and the spring presented a pleasant seed time and indicated a plenteous harvest. My father, with the assist assistance of his oldest sons, 
repaired his farm as usual, and was daily preparing the soil for the reception of the seed. His cattle and his sheep were numerous, and according to the best idea of wealth that I can now form, he was wealthy. But alas, how transitory are all human affairs, how fleeting are riches, how brittle the invisible thread on which all earthly comforts are suspended. Peace in a moment can take an immeasurable flight. Health can lose its rosy cheeks and life will vanish like a vapor at the appearance of the sun. In one fatal day, our prospects were all blasted and death by cruel hands inflicted upon almost the whole of the family. On a pleasant day in the spring of 1755, when my father was sowing flaxseed and my brothers driving the teams, I was sent to a neighbor's house, a distance of perhaps a mile, to procure a horse and return with it the next morning. I went as I was directed. I was out of the house in the beginning of the evening, and I saw a sheet widespread approaching toward me, in which I was caught. As I, have as I have ever since believed, and deprived of all my senses. The family soon found me on the ground, almost lifeless, as they said, took me in and made use of every remedy in their power for my recovery. But without effect till daybreak, when my senses returned, I soon found myself in good health, so that I went home with the horse very early in the morning. The appearance of that sheet I have ever considered as a forerunner of the melancholy catastrophe that so soon afterward happened to our family, and my being caught in it, I believe, was ominous of my preservation from death at the time we were captured. Chapter 2, Her Education, Captivity, Journey to Fort Pitt, Mother's Farewell Address, Murder of Her Family, Preparation of the Scalps, Indian Precautions, Arrival at Fort Pitt. My education had received as much attention from my parents as their situation in a new country would admit. I had been at school some where I learned to read in a book that was about half as large as a Bible, and in the Bible I'd, I had read a little. I had also learned the Catechism, which I used to frequently repeat to my parents, and every night before I went to bed, I was obliged to stand up before my mother and repeat some words that I suppose were a prayer. My reading, catechism, and prayers I have long since forgotten, though for a number of the first years that I lived with the Indians, I repeated the prayers as often as I had any opportunity. After the Revolutionary War, I remembered the names of some of the letters when I saw them, but have never read a word since I was taken a prisoner. It is but a few years since a missionary kindly gave me a Bible, which I am very fond of hearing my neighbors read to me, and should be pleased to learn to read it myself, but my sight has been for a number of years so dim that I've not been able to distinguish one letter from another. As I before observed, I got home with the horses very early in the morning, where I found a man that lived in our neighborhood, and his sister-in-law, who, who had been who had three children, one son and two daughters. I soon learned that they had come there to live just for a short time, but for what purpose I cannot say. The woman's husband, however, was at that time in Washington's army fighting for his country. And as her brother-in-law had a house, she had lived with him in his absence. Their names though, I have forgotten. Immediately after I got home, the man took the horse to go to his house after a bag of grain, and he took his gun in his hand for the purpose of killing game, if he should chance to see any. Our family, as usual, was busily employed about their common business. Father was shaving an axe helv at the side of the house. Mother was making preparations for breakfast. My two oldest brothers were at work near the barn, and the little ones, with myself and the woman and her three children, were all in the house. Breakfast was not yet ready when we were alarmed by the discharge of a number of guns that seemed to be near. Mother and the women before mentioned almost fainted at the report and everyone trembled with fear. On opening the door, the man and horse lay dead near the house, having just been shot by the Indians. I was afterward informed that the Indians discovered him at his own house with his gun and pursued him to my father's, where they shot him, as I have related. They first secured my father and then rushed into the house and without the least resistance made prisoners of my mother, Robert, Matthew, Betsy, 
the women and her three the woman and her three children and myself and then commenced plundering my two brothers thomas and john being at the barn escaped and went to virginia where my grandfather Irwin lived i was informed by a mr fields who was at my house about the close about the close of the revolutionary war the party that took us consisted of six indians and four Frenchmen who, who immediately commenced plundering, as I just observed, and took what they considered most valuable, consisting principally of bread, meal, and meat. Having taken as much provision as they could carry, they set out with their prisoners in great haste for fear of detection, and soon entered into the woods. On our march that day, an Indian went behind us with a whip, with which he frequently lashed the children to make them keep up. In this manner, we traveled until dark without a mouthful of food or even a drop of water, although we had not eaten since the night before. Whenever the little children cried for water, the Indians would make them drink urine or go thirsty. At night, they encamped in the woods without fire and without shelter, where we were watched with the greatest vigilance. Extremely fatigued and very hungry, we were compelled to lie upon the ground supperless and without a drop of water to satisfy the cravings of our appetites. As in the daytime, so the little ones were made to drink urine in the, urine in the night if they cried for any water. Fatigue alone brought us a little sleep for the refreshment of our weary limbs. And at the dawn of day, we were again started on our march in the same order that we had proceeded on the day before. About sunrise, we were halted and the Indians gave us a full breakfast of provision that they had brought from my father's house. Each of us being very hungry, partook of this bounty of the Indians, except father who was so much overcome with his situation, so much exhausted by anxiety and grief that silent despair seemed fastened upon his, count upon his countenance and he could not be prevailed upon to refresh his sinking nature by the use of a morsel of food. Our repast being finished, we again resumed our march, and before noon passed a small fort that I heard my father say was called Fort Kenagoshiji. That was the only time that I heard him speak from the time we were taken till, the, till, till we were finally separated the following night. Toward evening, we arrived at the border of a dark and dismal swamp, which was covered with small hemlock, or some other evergreen and other bushes too into which we were conducted and having gone a short distance we stopped and camped for the night here we had some bread and meat for supper but the dreariness of our situation together with the uncertainty under which we all labored as to our future destiny almost deprived us of the sense of hunger and destroyed our relish for food Mother, from the time we were taken, had manifested a great degree of fortitude and encouraged us to support our troubles without any complaining, and by her conversation seemed to make the distance and time shorter and the way much more smooth. But father lost all his ambition in the beginning of our trouble and continued apparently lost to every care, absorbed in melancholy. Here as before, she insisted on the necessity of our eating, and we obeyed her, but it was done with very heavy hearts. As soon as I had finished my supper, an Indian took off my shoes and my stockings and put a pair of moccasins on my feet, which my mother observed, and believing that they would spare my life, even if they should destroy the other captives, addressed me as near as I can remember in the following words. Ah, my dear little Mary, I fear that the time has arrived when we must be parted forever. Your life, my child, I think will be spared, but we shall probably be tomahawked here in this lonesome place by the Indians. Oh, how can I part with you, my darling? What will become of my sweet little Mary? Oh, how can I think of your being continued in captivity without a hope of your being rescued? Oh, that death had snatched you from my embraces in your infancy. The pain of parting then would have been pleasing to what it now is and I should have seen the end of your troubles. Alas, my dear, my heart bleeds at the thoughts of what awaits you, but if you leave us, remember, my child, your own name and the name of your father and your mother. Be careful and not forget your English tongue. If you shall have an opportunity to get away from the Indians, don't try to escape, for if you do, they will find and destroy you. Don't forget, my little daughter, 
the prayers that I have learned you. Say them often. Be a good child and God will bless you. May God bless you, my child, and make you comfortable and happy. During this time, the Indians stripped the shoes and stockings from the little boy that belonged to the woman who was taken with us and put moccasins on his feet too, as they had done before on mine. I was crying. An Indian took the little boy and myself by the hand to lead us off from the company when my mother exclaimed, don't cry, Mary, don't cry, my child. God will bless you. Farewell, farewell. The Indian led us some distance into the bushes or woods and there lay down with us to spend the night. The recollection of parting with my tender mother kept me awake while the tears constantly flowed from my eyes. A number of times in the night, the little boy begged of me earnestly to run away with him and get clear of the Indians. But remembering the advice I had so lately received and knowing the dangers to which we should be exposed in traveling without a path and without a guide through a wilderness unknown to us, I told him that I would not go and persuaded him to lie still till morning. Early the next morning, the Indians and Frenchmen that we had left the night before came to us, but our friends were left behind. It is impossible for anyone to form a correct idea of what my feelings were at that sight of those savages whom I supposed had murdered my parents and brothers, sister and friends, and left them in the swamp to be devoured, devoured by wild beasts. But what could I do? A poor little defenseless girl without any power or means of escaping, without a home to go to, even if I could be liberated, without a knowledge of the direction or distance to my formal, former place of residence, and without a living friend to whom to fly for protection. I felt a kind of horror and anxiety and dread that to me seemed insupportable. I durst not cry, I durst not complain, and to inquire of them the, state, the fate of my friends, even if I could have mustered resolution, was beyond my ability, as I could not speak their language, nor they understand mine. My only relief was in silent, stifled sobs. My suspicions as to the fate of my parents proved too true, for soon after I left them, they were killed and scalped together with Robert, Matthew, Betsy, and the wo woman and her two children and mangled in the most shocking manner. Having given the little boy and myself some bread and meat for breakfast, they led us on as fast as we could travel. And one of them went behind and with a long staff picked up all the grass and weeds that we trailed down by going over them. By taking that precaution, they avoided detection for each weed was so nicely placed in its natural position that no one would have ever suspected that we had passed that way. It's the custom of Indians when scouting or on private expeditions to step carefully and where no impression, and where no impression of their feet can be left, shunning wet or muddy ground. They seldom take hold of a bush or a limb and never break one. And by observing those precautions and that of setting up the weeds and the grass, which they necessarily lop down, they completely elude the sagacity of their pursuers and they escape that punishment which they are conscious they merit from the hand of justice. After a hard day's march, we encamped in a thicket where the Indians made a shelter of bows and then built a good fire to warm and dry our benumbed limbs and clothing, for it had rained some through the day. Here we were again fed as before. When the Indians had finished their supper, they took from their baggage a number of scalps and went about preparing them for the market or to keep without spoiling by, stra by straining them over small hoops, which they prepared for that purpose, and then drying and scraping them by the fire. Having put the scalps yet wet and, blo yet wet and bloody upon the hoops and stretched them to their full extent, they held them to the fire till they were partly dried and then with their knives commenced scraping off the flesh and in that way continued to work, alternately drying and scraping them till they were dry and clean. That being done, they combed the hair in the neatest manner and then painted it and the edges of the scalps yet on the hoops red. Those scalps I knew at that time must have been taken from our family by the color of the hair. My mother's hair was red and I could easily distinguish my father's and the children's from each other. That sight was most appalling, yet I was obliged to endure it without any complaining. 
In the course of the night, they made me to understand that they should not have killed the family if the whites had not pursued them. Mr. Fields, whom I have before mentioned, in, informed me that at the time we were taken, he lived in the vicinity of my father and that on hearing of our captivity, the whole neighborhood turned out in pursuit of the enemy and to, and to deliver us, if at all possible, but that their efforts were unavailing. They, however, pursued us to the dark swamp where they found my father, his family and companions stripped and mangled in the most inhuman manner. That from thence the march of the cruel monsters could not be traced in any direction and that they returned to their homes with the melancholy tidings of our misfortunes, supposing that we had all shared in the massacre. massacre. The next morning we went on, the Indian going behind us and setting up the weeds as on the day before. At night we encamped on the ground in the open air without a shelter or a fire. In the morning we, set a, in the morning we again set out early and traveled as though on two former days, though the weather was extremely uncomfortable from the continually falling rain and snow. At night, the snow fell very fast and the Indians built a shelter of boughs and a fire where we rested tolerably dry through all of that and the two succeeding nights. When we stopped and before the fire was kindled, I was so much fatigued from running and so far benumbed by the wet and the cold that I expected that I, I must fail and die before I could get warm and comfortable. The fire, however, soon restored my circulation, and after I had taken my supper, I felt so that I rested well through the night. On account of the storm, we were two days at that place. On one of those days, a party consisting of six Indians who had been to the frontier settlements came to where we were and brought with them one prisoner, a young white man who was very tired and dejected. His name I have forgotten. Misery certainly loves company. I was extremely glad to see him, though I knew from his appearance that his situation was as deplorable as mine and that he could afford me no kind of assistance. In the afternoon, the Indians killed a deer, which they dressed and then roasted it whole, which made them a full meal. We were, we were each allowed a share of their venison and some bread, so that we made a good meal also. Having spent three nights and two days at that place and the storm having ceased early in the morning, the whole company consisting of 12 Indians, four Frenchmen, the young man, the little boy and myself, all moved on at a moderate pace without an Indian behind us to deceive our pursuers. In the afternoon, we came in sight of Fort Pitt, as it's now called, where we were halted while the Indians performed some customs upon their prisoners, which they deemed necessary. That fort was then occupied by the French and Indians and was called Fort Duquesne. It stood at the junction of the Monongahala, which is said to signify in some of the Indian languages, the falling in banks and the Allegheny, and the Allegheny rivers where the Ohio River begins to take its name. The word Ohio signifies bloody. At the place where we halted, the Indians combed the hair of the young man, the boy and myself, and then painted our faces in hair red in the finest Indian style. We were then conducted into the into the fort where we received a little bread and were then shut up and left to tarry alone through the night. So I will stop there with the recounting of Mary Jemison's life. Um, join me next time to hear chapters three and four. Goodbye.